Hi, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. And I'm Vladimiro Mojica. I'm a professor of chemistry at School of Molecular Sciences, Arizona State University. So, Vladi, um, looking and teaching uh, BCH 341, which is physical chemistry for the, with a biological focus, and I would say we even have a specific focus being in the molecular sciences, kind of a molecular focus uh, when we're doing this. And we have a website where, where a lot of this links to uh, information related to this class will be. Um, but one of the things I think we both liked about using Atkins as a guideline or a textbook to looking at, at physical chemistry um, in the life sciences or for, or for biochemists or people who are biologically focused is they do a really good conceptual job of, of discussing things in a way to give you real conceptual understandings of material, not just pragmatic how to work problems. And so we've been making a series of, of lectures kind of going through several of these. And one of the ones I got explicitly asked about um, by a student is this one. And uh, it really just it, it says, explain the limitations of the following expressions, and it gives two expressions. But I think we could literally do this infinitesimal number of times. And I like to start by saying, I think one of the things I have seen in teaching kind of physical chemistry at the undergraduate level numerous times over the years is uh, what I call a fundamental issue that a lot of students have, which is um, they really just try to use a concept that worked okay for them in introductory chemistry, which is they look at the back of every chapter and they have a summary of equations. And, and half the time we even allow them just to bring a summary of equations or a cheat sheet of equations in with them in exams, right? Because we tell them it's not about memorizing equations, right? But what, they, what this propagates is they just look for the right equation to solve the problem that they have. And while that often works at, at some of the very introductory levels where we're teaching, where the problems we're giving them are often just one step, or what we would often just call crudely plug and chug type problems, by the time you get to more advanced levels of physical chemistry, this rarely works. It's rarely just plugging in you know, some distilled equation that fits a specific problem. Usually when we're trying to teach concepts and, and problem solving, we're now getting to multi-step problems. Right, and <clears throat> this particular equation, it's a, it's a beautiful example of that. Because when you try to establish a difference between energy, that's the U you have there, and enthalpy, that's the H you have there, both of them are energy variables. So in principle, you might go back to the definition of energy as the ability to do work and then ask the question, so if energy is that, what is enthalpy? Right. And in, in, so it, it turns out that they are, they are very much related, but in, in this definition, there is something that you do that remove the PV work from the equation. And in doing that, you eliminate something that in chemistry is very important. Well, it depends on what you want to do. Because, for instance, if you want to talk about bone formation and breaking, you don't want the PV term there. And this is what enthalpy does, does for you. Yeah. It, it gives you a direct measure of how bonds are formed and broken in a molecule. You can do it with the total energy, but then you will have to be subtracting the, the ability of these molecules to do work. If you want to concentrate it on the bond, so, so from the chemical point of view, enthalpy is a wonderful tool. The other two, but it depends on what you want right. to do. And, 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 and this is what is reflected in this equation. I mean, you don't see the full mathematics, but if you did it, Starting from the definition. But like age. you said, I, I think that's even, that's such an important point. I think it's even worth, in fact, if, if students ask me, like, I tell them, you know, never just, you know, yes, there's a lot of convenient equations that get used under very convenient, but knowing what all the assumptions were, how they were derived, that's really where most of the understanding comes from. And if, if students ask me, well, how do you, I always, like you said, like, you know, I always start definitionally. And like you said, like, you know, the definition of what, um, I don't know how that, uh, 
of, of what the enthalpy is, is, you know, it's directly related to just the internal energy. We could write, you know, other ones like the Helmholtz free energy. We could write the Gibbs, you know, free energy. Um, and because this is defined as H, we often write this as H minus TS. In other words, like you said, and these are all energies, right? These are all energies and we use them at different times. I, the way I even like to explain it to students is just like sometimes we use polar coordinates versus X, Y, you know, versus mm -hmm. Cartesian, et cetera. We move to different reference frames for energy because of their convenience factor in, in understanding the problem that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, oftentimes, in fact, how this one gets introduced initially is often uh, almost in every introductory chemistry and, and physical chemistry book, it starts getting introduced by its idea of eliminating mechanical work and giving you an energy that's just related to heat associated right. with the right. system. And then you see, if you look at the definition you just wrote there, H equal to U plus PV. We, could, we can figure then, this then out you very that simply. You we see can that just derivative. take the derivative. Right. You see that there is a missing term there. Yeah, we can take the derivative. In fact, I would write it most generally like that. Right. And then we can expand uh, through PDV plus VD. Right. E. And, and, it, and, and it now can't... there's a contradiction, right? right? Like now there's a contradiction to this equation. So there must be an assumption made. Right. And then you see that the assumption, just by looking at this equation, you know is that is. that equation is valid if you consider a process at constant P. Yeah. If delta P is if equal delta to P is equal to zero, the, the process at constant P, then you can write delta H equal to delta U plus P delta V, and there's no approximation. If you establish the constraint that that equation is a constant P. Right. And we're fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I think, you know, doing some of this, deriving through and, and, and keeping it, you know, at this level, I think it's also important to start looking at this kind of at a, cal you know, calculus-based perspective. You can always you you know, have one integrate. Minor, minor mistake there. The, the, the last one, Del DH equal to DU. You wrote DH on the right-hand side, too. Oop, you're right. You this, is a, this is another one well, of our, the problems well, we do, right? Yeah, we no, you, we you, get so you, you, used to. You, you told me I was not supposed to write right. today. Yeah, so, yeah. So I'm well, just, and I, I, who says I'm I'm just, I need enough? I, but we'll I'm see. just the spotter here. Yeah. Good. Good catch. Well, and then I, I even like to remind in, in old textbooks, often you'll, you know, energy gets, you know, right. whether it's D, uh, E or DU. But, but I would say most modern textbooks now use U for internal for energy. Internal, yeah, yeah. So... Okay, I think that kind of uh, gets some uh, going on this one. And then the other one they kind of show is what I would say, I would, I would look at this and say, this is nowhere near, you know, a fundamental equation at all. Um, I can tell, I mean, just because uh, you and I have looked at so many thermodynamic problems over the years, you know, the immediate thing I think of when I see this is, is they're showing something, you know, related that you use so often in Hess's law in that you want to do some reaction at, at some random temperature, but you're always given tables at room temperature and they say it's never a big deal because you can always take the reactants, take them down to room temperature, do that reaction at room temperature where you know all the standard states and then take the products back up. And how do you take things that some random temperature to room temperature, you do that through its heat capacity. Now it simplifies to this type of equation when those heat capacities are temperature independent so that you can literally just say it's delta CP in that it's independent over the temperature range from right. whatever which, T which, which is, prime I mean, is to if, T. If we want to think of that expression as an operational expression, you are linearizing. So you are looking at the linear behavior, linear change of in, in enthalpy with temperature change now you can think of this if you if you are more uh, you know more savvy in mathematics then you might look at this as a taylor expansion and then you will see that you are taking the, f the first term. term yeah so you have you have the a, a temperature independent term which is delta h naught and then you have a second term that was linear with the temperature so now again we have this 
kind of connections that if you are able to, to think of the Taylor expansion, then you understand that there is a mathematical connection here and you're doing nothing very different. You, and, and from the, uh, let's say, from the experimental point of view, or the operational point of view, you are studying changes in enthalpy that are approximately as being linear with the temperature, which is equivalent to say that you are Taylor expanding your function and then you are picking up the linear term. Right. And then I think it's appropriate based on you know, where this chapter is going, is talking about from things kind of from a molecular standpoint, like, you know, just like the last one, you know, like how good are the assumptions that you're often at constant pressure? Well, usually you know that you're doing in a reaction, you're doing it in an open atmosphere, you know you're at constant pressure, good assumption. You know, what the, the major assumption here is, is that the heat capacity over this temperature range is scalar or independent of, right. of temperature. And, you know, how good of assumption is that? Well, you would have to know the system. You would have to know the temperature range in the system. But just speaking, you know, observationally, you know, if this is covering a very large temperature range, especially as you get to really low temperatures, then that's a horrible assumption. Right. But if it's covering yeah. a higher temperature range where there's no phase transition, there's, uh, and, you know, what I would call once you've already gotten past all of the, you know, vibration, you know, getting up through most of the vibrational degrees of freedom, et cetera, then it often is a very good assumption. Yeah, and, and this brings us back to our previous discussion. Heat capacity measures how much the temperature of the system changing with, changes when you put in heat or energy into the system. Now, <clears throat> if you are at very low temperature, now our previous discussion, you perturb the most out of the yeah. system when it is a very low temperature and you add a little bit of energy. Now, that approximation, as you just said, can possibly work at very low temperatures. At very low temperatures, you have a way more complicated behavior. Now, right. statistical mechanics, going back to our previous discussion too, it gives you a limit where that is going to work out beautifully. Something called in statistical mechanics, the equipartition theorem. When you are in that domain that each energy term, each quadratic energy terms contributes with one half kT to the heat capacity, then you know exactly that you can use that because right. the heat capacity and is going to be a number. The, and this is something they see. quite. If you just you, Wikipedia, you know, heat capacity, one of the things that it'll classically show you is here's a monatomic gas, here's a diatomic, here's a triatomic. Right. And what does it sit And How do you figure out what each of those terms are? And, and just what you said, like you yeah. start using um, and if you go to a solid in the domain where heat capacity is constant, then you have something called the Dulong Petit, Petit. Yeah. law that allows you, it, it, it was one of the first methods to determine atomic weights, in fact. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I do like to, you know, and for, for students who are looking, you know, you know, uh, like we did for the last one of really kind of deriving where this comes from, you know, what I would encourage is like we said, like starting with what I would say is very fundamental in, you know, any freshman chemistry on type class, like you said, you want to do, you know, at some, you know, random temperature, maybe not a standard state temperature. Um, you can always, you know, take these to the temperature of a standard state of 298 of where you have the tables, um, do the reaction and come back down. And you'll see that it's these components that if they're scalar independent will give you this delta you know, CP term, mm -hmm. that it's the adding and subtracting of these change, assuming that it's just a CP DT term and that it goes through um, that the integral goes through there, that it's constant. Right, so that gives us the opportunity to, uh, to mention that the R, the sub-index R in all these things, in this equation is the delta reaction. Yes, and, so, and I think that is. And some people will write it Rxn to be exactly. even more explicit. Right. Some people will put it, you know, on this side. And, and this is, I get a practical frustration for students that there's several kind of nomenclatures used in where you put a bunch of the subscripts and superscripts. But I, I really encourage you not to get lost in that and realize how homogeneous a lot of these things look. And to understanding just a few of basic 
you know, nomenclature things in thermodynamics and math, I think it gets you a long ways. Yeah, and we leave that for students to see how this changes if you put different stoichiometric coefficients. Yeah, in front, exactly. Because energy turn, and enthalpy too turns out to be an extensive quantity, mm -hmm. except if you divide by, by the total The molar. molar. So you have to be, to be mindful of that, that for the way this reaction is written with uh, a stoichiometric coefficients equal to one, that is just that. Fine. But if you have to be careful. If you do anything more. Yeah. And I think it's something that I think it's very worth mentioning because it, it, it's so confusing to students. Half the time when they see this, but they look up these tables and it's always joules per mole. And so really what they're being given is, and there's several ways to write this. Some people would write it with a bar yeah. over the top. Some people would use a small h to indicate that it's a molar quantity. But we do that so often that we use, in a sense, the we don't take these extensive variables, typically energy variables, uh, but uh, and we often make them intensive by making them molar quantities. Yeah. And we, do, we don't even really discuss it. And, and oftentimes books go back and forth without ever yeah. even, uh, you know, really explicitly stating it. The and same the, and the, is 100% exactly. true with heat capacity. Exactly. You, and, and should you write it, you know, to explicitly let them know that it's a molar quantity or a lower case? Yes, but it's very common that people just leave that. You can tell by the units alone whether it's molar or not. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you if you do if you don't use molar quantities, then this becomes a huge number. I mean, it yeah. would be the same as given our weight in, in nanograms. Right. So each time we say uh, your weight in nanograms, we'll have to multiply it by 10 to the 9 to bring it to grams and then something to bring it to kilos. Yeah. So it would be very inconvenient to say that my weight is 10 times to the 10 right. <laughs> nanograms or whatever. So that's why, I mean, we have to, we, I mean, we have to understand that uh, when we take uh, mol mol molar quantities, we are making ourselves a favor in, in, in manipulating these numbers. Right. Yeah. And uh, OK, well, I think that, you know, uh, gives a good discussion for students on, on this uh, question as well. So thanks today. Thanks for you.